Hello everybody, here's Heidi from the wisdomfactory.net. And today, yes, we have a conversation that matters, but actually it's inside our conscious aging series because we want to talk about the structures for people in the third half of their lives in the USA. And we have an expert in this question here as our guest, and this is Bonnie Vallette. And before we enter into the question, into the conversation, I would like you to give a little bit of a background where you are coming from and why it is interesting to you. And what do you want to convey with your work? Okay. Um, I have served churches for 20 years of my career. Um, and the churches that I've served had been primarily populated with folks in the third act of their lives. Um, so I became very conversant with elders and the challenges that they face. When I decided to make a career change, um, it seemed natural to move into elder care proper. And I served a not-for-profit small nursing home in the Midwest in Circleville, Ohio. Um, and learned a great deal about the challenges facing both sides of the equation. So the elders and the providers and the community. And having that not-for-profit status allowed us some flexibility in how we could choose who to serve, um, even if they couldn't pay. Also in the States, there's a great deal of change in how elder what's called Medicaid, Med Medicare, um, pays for folks who need to go through a rehab process or just need um, a brief time away from home to kind of recharge their caregivers and themselves. And so as those changes are unfolding, we're learning that elders need to stay in their homes to receive maximum benefits of payments. Well, how do you support someone who perhaps doesn't have any family or friends in the area? Um, the area that I serve has been economically impacted. And so a lot of the children have moved out of the area. So now we have a lot of elders aging in place in homes that perhaps aren't conducive to aging in place. So how do we as a community come together to help support those folks, making sure they have proper nutrition, transportation when it's needed, um, just friendship and support, but then also help in paying their bills, in making sure that, that the assets that they have can continue into the future so that they have more possibilities. So let me ask, as you know, I'm not in the U.S., I'm in Europe and know a little bit about my home country, Germany, and I live here in Italy. And I was married with Mark, who came from America, and a little bit he has told me uh, about the system there and, you know, the strange thing that until you are old, you don't get uh, the, the, the medical uh, bills paid and stuff like this. And then the doctors call you and you have to go through all sorts of, you know, um, analysis or whatever, treatments, because that's how they get the money. So... I, I, I didn't really understand the system. So could you tell me a little bit how it was before? You say now it is changing to staying at home. How, how was it before? And how, how was getting older seen and treated in the USA? And then we can go back and see what is changing now. Because first I would like how it was so far. Okay. Um, in the 70s, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, CMS, um, facilitate the payments, set up the rules, and then enforce guidelines. Um, so payments only come when, say, a skilled nursing facility can prove someone who needs rehab continues to improve their well-being by being in that facility. Well, as you know, sometimes folks plateau and they just need a little more support until they can begin to build their strength yet again. So, so we, let me ask you, these people before are living alone or uh, 
they are not yet in a nursing home. Where, where did older people stay in the last okay. act of their life, let's say? Well, okay, so specific to the community that I serve, um, there, were, there were adequate jobs for children to remain in the same community and be able to support themselves and, and their own growing families. So elders had that additional support of family around them. So they may or may not have gone to a nursing home after surgery or even in the, the final you know, time of their life as, as they're moving towards passing. Yeah, um, how, how did they get the money? They, they had the social security. Did they have enough to be able to, to pay, uh, uh, how, how did you say, nursery home? Uh, or a, a place for older people, let's say a community a living, uh, did they have enough resources for that? At that point, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare paid a much higher percentage, much closer to the actual cost incurred by a nursing home or a therapy provider. Over time, that amount has shrunk. At the same time, folks have left the area. So there's this double bind in the community I serve where there are lower payouts to the nursing homes, which then keeps the payment for staff even um, very low in comparison to like say working at McDonald's. So there are all these various issues. It's very complex, of course. Um, and all of this is occurring at the same time as 10,000 people per day are retiring and entering into Medicare, which has not been aggressively or properly funded in the United States. So we're at this storm of, uh-oh, what are we gonna do now? And it seems that people don't have the answer to that. That's why community action is, is vitally important. Okay, so still the question before it was possible and maybe even normal, at least in the area where you are around, that elderly people were living with their children, with their families, Correct. or at least being supported by them uh, financially, maybe even? That's possible. Also, if they went to a nursing home, um, because of the way Medicare paid out, that nursing home had the resources to support them long term. So there were people who have lived in nursing homes for 30, 40 years, but the amount of money that the nursing home is receiving has stayed the same over time and not increased. So nursing homes are in the bind of finding it very hard to pay their own bills to support the folks who are living there. So when you say somebody lives in nursing home for 30 or 40 years, when I hear nursing home, I think it is for people really when they cannot do, they support themselves anymore, when they cannot walk or cook or clean or so on, you know, cannot live by themselves. Is that so or is it just my ignorance? <laughs> no, that's exactly the case. Typically, they're folks who are wheelchair bound and have very little upper body strength in order to care for themselves. In the U.S., they've introduced the idea of assisted living. And so that has begun to fill some of that gap so that people can have minimal support. It's still expensive and less is paid through Medicare. So there's much more that they have to provide their own money. So if they have savings or a pension, in addition to Social Security, they can take that route. And if they don't, what are they doing then? That's where the bind is. Um, there are very, very few places. So in the United States, once your assets reach $5,000 or less, you qualify for Medicaid, which is a different type of support system. So once people reach that place where they have no assets left at all, typically... Excuse me, uh, I, I'm, I'm not so good in English anymore. What does it mean having assets 5,000 or less? What does that mean? Um, so savings, mm -hmm. primarily. We'll okay. just 
call it savings of $5,000 or less, then they can apply for a different type of support. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But that support pays even less. So it's hard to find nursing homes that can afford to take a large number of Medicaid employ or, um, elders. So it's this, we're living through this really, really difficult time right now and getting adequate funding to make sure elders who can't stay in their own homes can find a place to live. So if they have more than $5,000 of savings, they get a little more or less. I, I didn't understand it. Anyway, $5,000 of saving are gone in, in two or three months. I mean, if you go in such a facility. So that doesn't really make sense to me. <laughs> well, it allows them to keep that $5,000 for the rest of their lives as they need to spend for various things. Yeah, but they are gone immediately, you know. I well, mean, they'll no longer be spending their private money to pay for care. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And typically they can keep their home and their car. Um, so that way there's still assets in the family, but it's, it's very frustrating. Yeah, and maybe not everybody has a family. People sometimes are alone when they get older. Exactly. Living in an apartment, perhaps they've already given up their car. So that safety net of them having their own money just falls away very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if I've understood right, that's where you come in and create community for these people? What we're working on within our community is a networking group that includes people who are in the business for profit. So nursing homes, assisted living providers, therapy providers, as well as government programs um, within the community, and then other support agencies. So we have what's called the YMCA, which is a community-based um, resource that offers inexpensive ways to join a gym or go to the pool. Um, and then our senior centers, which tend to be places where folks meet and services are provided a hot meal every day uh, either in the facility in the nursing or the senior center itself or delivered to their homes um, and then other not-for-profit agencies or development groups that can come together and talk about these larger social safety nets um, and, and I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but that's what I'm working on currently. This is a great idea. So what is your idea? What is your goal? What would you envision to, to read? Um, basically, I want to ensure that there are mechanisms in place that if an elder finds themselves in a dire circumstance, that this group could be activated to help solve the underlying issue of that particular elder's dilemma. Um, eventually getting to the point that there will be resources in place so that as soon as something unravels within our community, we can be aware and we can take appropriate action quickly. And I'm hoping by inviting in a lot of different voices, we'll be able to see some of the edges of what that might look like um and that meeting's happening on tuesday so it hasn't happened yet i don't know what those edges are going to be but i know that we may need to seek funding and and that's part of the challenge i don't know what that's going to look like so when you need funding where do you go i mean work with elders and uh, Healthcare is not something somebody would invest in to get money out of it. So you need to have some um, agape, some p people who do it yes. for, for compassion. And where are those people? <laughs> well, we'll be tapping the local churches um, to hopefully have a volunteer group of people who would be willing to help uh, an elder when they, they have issues that need immediate resolution, 
So like transportation to a doctor's office visit um, or a meal at a particular time. But the overall goal will be to work with our philanthropy that already exists in the community to set aside funds that will be available to appropriately address needs, especially emergency needs um, at the moment that they're needed. Um, and I we have a local foundation, the Pickaway County Foundation, that is extremely responsive um, to needs within the community. So I'm hoping to engage them in this conversation as well. You were talking about volunteer work. Have you ever thought about this concept, which I find great, that younger people work for elder people for free and t count the numbers of hours they have done and then they have a right that it will be repaid to them when they need help. That has been a, a trial in some place of the world. I've forgotten where it was, but it, it seemed to have worked quite well. And so my question is also, why don't we do that? <laughs> yes, agreed. In Pickway County, they've just um, begun an initiative called Kindness. Um, and part of that is high school students who need volunteer hours in order to um, have a good resume when they apply for colleges have been serving the city itself, but tapping some of those kids to serve the elder population is something that I would like to discuss with uh, the leaders in our community. Also, um, church members who like to volunteer and are looking for outlets for their volunteerism, um, that's, that's been a powerful element in our community. There's a whole group called the Circle of Caring that was, has been traditionally offered through our local hospital. Um, that whole system is changing. It's just been bought out by a larger hospital. And so we don't know exactly where those chips will fall, but hopefully those volunteers will make themselves available for this type of program also. And so this sort of exchange that then they will have assistance when they need it, is that uh, so too? That Because many people, you know, in our age, we could go and help people. And then it would be nice that to know when we are really alone at the end, uh, that there would be somebody there for us. So it's always insecure, you know. Yes, we like to work for others and we like to help others. But, you know, it would also be nice to know that then somebody is there for you, you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at developing an app for volunteerism in the county. And, and that may be one of the aspects of that. So that as you build up community service hours, those hours that would be available to you or your loved ones, when the time arises that, that there's a need. I do think that would be the future of care anyway, that we, uh, the population, don't rely too much on all these institutions, but take it, organize it ourselves in this way, you know, with this trust that now I give and later I, I get it back in some way, you know, that would be really great. And if you are such an activist, you surely <laughs> be able to do something in that direction. <laughs> Yeah, and there are, um, I don't know if you have this in Germany, but um, there are agencies on aging in our community. And through that system, we can also um, receive assistance like um, for someone who doesn't have an advocate, like their family is no longer available to them or, or they're living completely alone they can go through a process, a volunteer can go through a process to become an advocate. And it's, it's a court type process. So they have legal responsibilities. Um, but a lot of it is just making sure that individual feels supported through visitation, maybe helping to make decisions on behalf of the individual once they get to know the individual well and understand their goals um, for the, the end of their life. Um, I would love to see that program expanded. I know that this exists from the churches. They have visit service. So once a week they go and visit the elders and 
and talk to them or bring have coffee together or bring them something or do some little shopping. I don't know how far it is privately. Yeah, I mean, when you're in the family, you do that for sure. Um, there is sort of social service in Germany who will uh, do some of these things, you know, uh, when you you have you you should have paid during the work time uh an in insurance to the state which is called um care insurance or something pflegeversicherung and then there are several levels where you can then ask for that and that means that maybe when you are in level one you get just a little more money in level two you get a nurse coming in the morning and the evening and you don't have to pay and something there are several levels uh, but i know that many of these things also the social services are in danger because they don't have enough people to, to work for them, also because they are not paid well and they have a lot to do, you know. And I know one thing, I don't know if you have heard it in the integral context, uh, Butswix or something in, in, I've forgotten the name, it's, it's in Dutch. They have a nursing system which was named in, in Frederick Laloux's uh, book, you know, uh, Re uh, Reinventing Organizations. They have done a nursing <laughs> let's say company, but it's not really a company anymore. It was a company before owned by one person. And then they have changed the structure so that they uh, they are organized in out, almost autom autonomous groups of, of work and they organize their work by themselves. And so what came out was that now the nurses have much more time for the, for the people who they are visiting and that's not like normally. Normally, one nurse comes the morning, the other one the evening, and then the, the patient or the old, older person has no, or the receiver of this care, has no contact really because they are always changing. And with this new self-organized system, they uh, have only two or three people going always to the same person and also having let's say, a chat with them or even have a coffee with them so that they are creating also the, the, the psychological connection with the older people, which is so important for, for living. You cannot only just get the injection and get washed and go, then you are left alone, you know. And the strange thing is that with the self-organization, this company is working much better the, the 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 patients let's say are happy and that has spread so far that i think now 80 percent in in the netherlands are organized like this and other countries have taken over this model for nursing and so it gets also more interesting even if the nurses don't earn so much money as maybe a professor at the university or something or a doctor but they have a satisfactory profession they love to go there but before they had to run from one to the other always quick have only five minutes for that five minutes for that and so on and now everybody's happy <laughs> so the question is um how long will it take until uh, <laughs> the organizations will take over a model like this and um, the state will understand that this is working that the money they have to give is spent much better in an organization like that than in a traditional um, thing. Did, have you known about that? Uh, yes, yeah. the Reinventing Organizations was yeah. one of those books that kind of changed how I look at business mm -hmm. um, and understanding that flattening the hierarchy, um, making sure that everyone who is in a leadership position understands that we're in it together and then being supportive of the folks who may not feel that they're in a leadership position to empower them to offer leadership um, and one of the the processes i've learned about is called eden philosophy and it is about that it's about making sure that primarily the elder is the center of anything that we do the elders wishes for their own best 
life lived. And the people who are closest to the elders tend to be the ones who are the least paid. They're offering the direct care, but they're the ones with the insight into what the elder needs on a day-to-day -day basis. So leadership being able to hear them, these, we call them state-tested nursing assistants in the US. Um, and they tend to be underpaid and underappreciated and looked at by, by some leaders as a dime a dozen, and they are not. They are called to this work through their hearts. And when you begin to empower them to speak to leadership in ways that are gentle but firm, um, this, the experience that the elder has is increased dramatically. It becomes this life-giving relationship, even in a long-term care facility. Um, so yes, I would love to see reinventing organizations used more fully in elder care in this country flattening that hierarchy, um, the companies that are in it for profit, um, not worrying about maybe paying out to their shareholders as much as looking at everyone who is impacted by their business model. That means the elders served, the people serving the elders, the wider community, um, as well as, as shareholders, but all the stakeholders need to be included. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it will come, yeah. Um, I was thinking about that, uh, what you're saying, that the people nearest to, the, to, to an ill person or an or elder person, a person, let's say, in need, they know best. And normally in the traditional systems, they are not even uh, heard, you know. I saw that here with Mark in the hospital, you know. You really have to insist. And if there is nobody around who insists for you, if you can't do it anymore, then it's really a, a problem. So instead of, 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 of tapping into the resource which these people can give you, the information, uh, they just, oh, I know everything, you know. And it, it, it's such an arrogance still in this hierarchical system that everybody who is higher thinks he knows best. And they don't. They just don't. <laughs> Yeah, we need to see that flip upside down. And yeah. we really, really do. Because the folks who are on the front line, they know best what's happening on the front mm -hmm. line. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's just to lead from the back. That's, yeah. that's not adequate anymore. It comes to my next question. So far, um, mostly there are women who are taking care for their parents, for instance. They are not, you know, they have neither social security payments. I mean, in Italy, you, you don't uh, pay into the, the funds. So the, and when you are older, you don't get out. No, you, it's not like a working contract that is, uh, automatically you p pay for the social things, no, for pension. And they normally don't. And they don't get a um, earning <clears throat> normally. And they just do it because, you know... <laughs> Somebody has to do it, and so you do it. I had the case of a, of a woman who was always serving her parents, and when they died, she was about 50, 52, and she hadn't learned any profession, anything, because it was a long uh, way for her parents to have to be there, and she had no money. The pension was away from their parents. They were for the parents and not for her. And so, you know, she was at the mercy of her brother, no state or um, institution would pay for her. I mean, you, you haven't worked, so you don't have, <laughs> you haven't worked, yeah. Uh, you haven't yeah, worked for exactly. money, but you have worked a lot. And now you are punished because you have worked without asking for money. So there is, uh, I was wondering how it is in, in, in America. I know that in Germany now, uh, I'm not sure about Italy, but in Germany, I had a friend who got 300 euros, which is about $350 or something a month for taking care for her mother, which if you think how much work you have, it's really not a whole lot, but at least something, you know. Yeah. How is wow. it in America? It's the same way. Mm -hmm. um, when my father was dying, I chose to leave uh, at that point, I was in, uh, I was doing business lending to 
other businesses, um, kind of on the fast track to like, you know, make a lot of money. And then dad became terminally ill and it was like, making money is not, not in that important taking care of my dad is. Um, and so I lost those years of wages, but I wouldn't have traded the experience of walking with him um, through the end of his life. So there are hard decisions that have to be made. And if there aren't resources, like you said, someone who's cared for a parent for 20, 30 years and suddenly finds themselves without the parent to care for and no credentialing or experience, it's, it's a bind. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. I wish I did, but I like the idea of at least having $350 a month, maybe to help. At least, but don't we have to change our mindset completely and uh, understand that care is an important thing and that is worthwhile money. I mean, childcare, now we are coming sort of into idea, yeah, childcare is worth money, you can pay for that, you know. But elder care or people who are not well off, that is still, you know, on the mercy of, 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 of some people or churches or institutions like, like you do, these organizations. Something is not right in that. But with the humanity in our systems, where is it? Agreed wholeheartedly and I don't know I don't know that the will is changing I know that the people that I work with the people that I serve that will is absolutely there what 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 do we need to do to change how this works especially since we're going to have more folks over the age of 65 than under the age of 17 in the next five years that shift there won't need to be daycare as much as there will need to be elder care. And so how do we get people to see that? And we've been talking about this since the seventies in this country. And it's like, everyone's standing around scratching their heads. It's like, where were our best and brightest thinkers over the last 40 years? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> what about the idea that People, when you're young, you think you never die and you never get old. And so you, you push it away, sort of a magic thinking. If I don't think about it, it won't arrive. And so I bet I don't think about it. And I ignore that there are people who are there and they would need my help. And also by the fact that normally families are not together anymore. Once there were at least three generations, and then it was normal that people get old. Now young people don't really have a good... Uh, connection to older people they often don't even know or have little contact with their grandparents so <laughs> we should become grandparents for hire <laughs> <laughs> and there's a movement in uh, the Jewish tradition where grandparents are available to grandparent other families if their own kids have moved away they can serve as a grandparent to another family in their synagogue um, I'd love to see that everywhere. That's the best way for the wisdom of our elders to percolate through the generations. And we need that. And it's for the young folk to teach the older folk how to use technology because none of us are very good with that. <laughs> yeah, and not only. Young folks often have uh, ideas uh, which can open our minds too you know, because we have already, you know, a certain line and they don't. So they are much more creative. And when we listen to them, instead of saying, oh, that's all rubbish, we could, would, we could learn some, something. And the younger folks could learn something from us. What I'm noticing is that many people, even in their 30s and 40s, you know, they think they don't have to ask older people. They know everything. You know, they know everything. And this is a little bit frustrating because after all, having done, I don't know, six decades now, <laughs> we have learned something. We have understood something. Maybe we are not so good in technology, but we have understood something about life and about inner life and about the conflicts and how to uh, uh, overcome conflicts or how to better not do. We have learned that too. Yes. And I am often wondering, why do they want to reinvent the wheel completely? You know, 
So they just could ask a little bit, you know, how was it for you? It doesn't mean that they have to adopt what we, but I don't see the curiosity, at least not in the surroundings where I am. Then, then you have to tell them something and they don't want to be told. So you shut your yes. mouth. And yes. with that, with that the, the wisdom you have um, gained is sort of under the carpet. And that's a shame, you know, because we have a lot to, to teach. Maybe not technology, maybe not other, other things, but some things we really do have to teach. And so the question is, do you see um, a possibility or is it just hap already happening in your country that the generations come together and learn from each other instead of being arrogantly separate? <laughs> In, in some ways, yes, I do see that. Um, there's been an initiative in the state for um, nursing homes and colleges to share rooms. So college students are paired with an elder, um, yeah, in, in a space that they share. And the relationships that develop are, of course, deep and rich and wide. Um, and I would wish that for every community that has a college and a nursing home, that, that they offer that as an option um, because both people benefit so greatly. This is great. I haven't heard that. That would be a good solution everywhere, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It would help the nursing homes to remain solvent to have enough income by having the college students pay for their room i i don't know it's it's happening slowly <laughs> wonderful really wonderful wow <coughs> so uh, you were telling me that you is it right do i remember right that you were involved with the saging movement yes in boulder colorado yeah. Um, I just happened to be there for a death and dying conference and their integral saging group was kicking off that Sunday night. So I made arrangements to stay so I could attend that group. Um, and that group has some amazing wisdom. Uh, they have a Facebook page where all of it's curated. So anyone who's interested in that, it's just integral saging, S A G E I N G. Um, and and take a look and, and join the group so maybe we should um, talk a bit about integral because maybe not everybody knows what that means and then what this group is up to yeah so integral is interesting as you know i um i came up through integral um through the work of ken wilbur and then began to learn about spiral dynamics and got to see the dovetailing of those two thought processes. That was so very powerful. Um, so my appreciation for integral is the mindfulness that in every moment that arises, there's an interior and an exterior experience of both the individual and the group that is having the experience it gives us a better way to work through how we say what we need to say, how it may be received, and how that reception in and of itself can work for us to become a deeper community or broader community, and then take action within the larger community. And, and it's a great lens to have when, like this new group that I'm, I'm hoping will get off the ground this coming Tuesday, um, how we're going to have an impact through our own personal development, through our development as a group, within the community that we're serving, and then the specifics of how we're going to impact that community so that there's no aspect that's left out of our decision making. I find that extraordinarily valuable. It is, because what normal constitutions do, they forget the interiors. They work on the exteriors, on the organization, and things have to be like this and blah, 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 blah. But how the people feel inside, how the community works as a community, 
is normally not recognized. And that's the big gift of integral that we know that these four elements belong together. And when we leave out one of them, then this is limping. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially the inner leadership aspect, um, having an understanding of what your interior process is. Um, I've been working with Finn Jackson and the churning resources for inner leadership to help me get clear about the places that, that I may have bias or have a misblink, incorrectly putting responsibility on someone else instead of myself. Um, and so I'm finding all these incredibly rich resources that have come up around integral and spiral dynamics that, you know, you find your favorite flavor and then you develop um, new skills and new understandings of yourself and others by using those. And, and it's so powerful just having clarity in and of oneself before moving into a group situation is life changing for everybody in the group. <laughs> yeah and it's also helpful not to end up into conflict and and strange fights you know which normally happens in groups because we we are able to to separate we, we are able to see that maybe one body well, somebody is using only the outside view and the other one is talking about the same thing from the inside view and they think they fight, but they're talking about the same thing. And when we have the integral understanding, we know that and we can sort of cut through the, <laughs> through the dissonance <laughs> and create consonance, you know? So that's wonderful. And so you plan something like the staging group is doing? Or how is it? Um, I have not started a group here in Ohio. That may be something that will like organically grow out of mm -hmm. this network that I'm, I'm, but I'm already offering facilitative leadership to a couple different networks in the community. Um, and, and I would like to expand both in reach, but also in depth. Um, and integral staging is a great way to start having those conversations about what's happening for you inside, especially so often, I think you mentioned a little while ago, in our 30s, 40s, even 50s, we may not want to think about life will end, but life will end. Um, and the sooner that we begin to understand there's going to be a process of aging and things are going to change and it's not bad, it's natural. Um, and then dealing with our own angst that we may not even know that we carry, that our life is going to end is a powerful tool to help us to get clear about our own purpose, our own responsibility to our own stuff, and even to be more compassionate with people wherever they are on their own journeys yeah. to have deeper relationships. That is another of my goals. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm casting a really wide net. <laughs> so that brings me to the questions. Do you have also for people who are in fear of dying, is there a um, possibility? Do you have psychological or some other ways of dealing with this, uh, this fear? I'm asking for, because I know uh, that many people say, for instance, magic mushrooms help to take off the fear of dying. There's experience, yeah, it's experience. I know people who, you know, have experienced that with their parents. And uh, so I'm wondering if you are aware of that and if people are using these techniques or what other techniques are they using to, to you know, to alleviate the, the, the angst, the existential angst to lose the body. Um, mostly my my primary focus has been on educating the actual caregivers to help them be, um, are you familiar with trauma-informed care? Understanding that everyone has been traumatized at some point in their life. And as we move towards death, very often those traumas come back up again to be healed. And so giving the caregivers tools to understand when someone is what we used to call acting out, 
Um, yeah, yeah. They are simply requesting that a need be met. And so it becomes incumbent on the caregiver to discover what that need is. And it may not be directly related to what the individual is acting out about, um, but that's usually the first clue that something is happening for that individual. Um, and, and that's mostly done through talk and touch. Mm -hmm. I've not investigated other, other avenues. But it comes to my mind, uh, a neighbor, uh, I found out that she, she had died. She was an old lady. Her husband had died some years ago and he, they were always friendly. They had always, you know, they were, even when he was over 80, he built something and said, one day I might need this in this way. And so I prepare already. So it was, you know, he, they were amazing. Then he was dead and uh, she was still alive and the children, uh, the daughter already quite old also her they went to into the house to live there and then i understood that she was dead and the daughter told me that in the last weeks she always cried screamed she screamed at night and she couldn't uh, um you know they, they they couldn't handle it anymore so they gave her in an institution and when you say that with a drama i thought oh dear yes that probably was a huge drama she couldn't hold anymore with kindness, while during the life she could. And then in the last few weeks, she couldn't anymore. And we don't have help for that. If I had known that, I could have gone there, but I'm not a psychologist, not a trained trauma therapist or something. I wouldn't just be there. You say touch. I, I, I do think touch might help in these cases. I don't know. Um. In the, the nursing home that I served, uh, a woman became extremely agitated every day about three o'clock. Um, and come to find out it was that the light coming in the window was extraordinarily bright. She didn't have words to express that. But one of the caregivers said, you know, I'm going to make it my, my job to find out why this woman gets so upset at three o'clock every day. And she started to notice that if she just put down the blind, the woman didn't have the panic attack. So we never know if being in a space as the person is triggered will give us some indication of what the triggering issue is and then further investigation can happen if the person's still verbal or talking to family. Um, one of the tools that are, is being used more in the U.S. now is a trauma-informed care, like 10 questions uh, that can be asked of anyone. They, they're using it in schools for kids who are coming into kindergarten. They ask the 10 questions to see what their home life is like. But ideally, it would be used also by any care provider, just checking in with, you know, were you mistreated as a child? Have you ever seen someone die? Um, I don't remember the 10 questions right now, but I can share that. Um, it would give us a better insight into what might trigger people and how we can work to help them resolve those traumas if possible with professional help as necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, we are so good in, in trying to stay composed that when we lose the, the, this power, then everything, let's say breaks loose. No, so yeah we need help but we need also acceptance when i yes. hear that then you just are given away into some institution where maybe they bind you on the bed or something that's yeah. oh we have no understanding of of these uh, situations and it's clear that the family cannot i mean it's difficult you know to 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 live in this situation i had a friend whose husband was um, in the Holocaust. He was in a, uh, in a camp. And she said, as long as they were married, he woke up every night screaming, crying, every night. And at, after 20 years or something, she said she couldn't anymore. She had to, she, she, she feared to, to go crazy, you know? And so she left him, which is not nice, too, but you, at a certain point, you have to decide what, what, what to do. So even for these neighbors, you know, they didn't know what to do. Uh, uh, I mean, we are not 
trained, we are not used to learn about this situation. We hope everything will be right, but it's not nobody has an idea and nobody can help you. So we would need to change our culture of, how can you say, I don't want to confine it only to death. I want to bring it to challenging situations in people's lives, which we try to not to not to see, you know. And and that starts at home. So like my own parents lived through the Great Depression and my mom's family, they lost everything. They moved into a home with a dirt floor. They, it, her father had been extraordinarily um, well respected as a, a builder. He owned his own service garage. I mean, you know, they, they were doing well but he chose to keep all of his employees on the payroll until all the money was gone. So in doing this good thing for the community, the family suffered. Shortly after they moved into the house with the dirt floor, her mother passed, and they say from a broken heart. Um, But I know that my mom's life was extraordinarily difficult, and yet she won't speak of it. Well, over time, those those traumas may be re-triggered, but we won't know what those traumas are. And I would ask every elder to be willing to find folks that they can speak to about those traumas so that there will be less suffering in the long term. But we all need that. Yeah, to to open up, to not be ashamed or whatever the, the emotion is, why they don't speak about it, but to realize that it is important. This is such a weight on the soul. It is important to to get it out. And this is part of uh, the understanding we have from psychotherapy, that only the fact that you can talk about these things already takes the pressure out of the pressure cooker, you know. It won't be healed completely, but it's not any more so explosive, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. So will we say that with our conversation, we also want to inspire people to not keep under the carpet these things, but find people to talk about it. And there are people who want to know your life stories. I'm happy to talk with people and listen to the life stories, you know, yes. because that's so important and so so fascinating for me to to hear life stories. We can do it on uh, on internet, you know. Uh, yeah. It can be public, not public. It, but you know, now in South Africa, you were there too. I and this week um, I was. Um, publishing or writing about uh, Mac, Frank McWeckwe, whom we uh, met in Henley Business School, and who told us uh, his uh, story of how he was came out of absolute poverty, and now he is, you know, well respected by his own, you know, by his own means, let's say. There was no state to take care for him and nobody else. So, but he had some good... Um, some good, um, let's say good karma maybe, but also he he took the chances when he could. So that's, by the way, it's on thewisdomfactory.net and I called it the American dream in Africa. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Cool. Yeah. So I love also the other person. I will still also uh, publish that. Uh, Caritas Uzeva, I think is her name. Uh, which in the conference she told her story about the, when she survived the genocide in Rwanda. And these are all stories, you know, which open your heart when you hear them. And you get a sort of, a, not a distance, but your own drama gets relative. Yeah. You see that you are not alone with having had unpleasant, let's say, uh, experiences. There are other people, and I would say everybody. So when people speak about their experiences, that's good. It's nothing shameful. It's really good for themselves and for us who we are listening, and we love to listen. I'm sure, Bonnie, you too. We can make the uh, (laughs) elderly listening club. (laughs) I love that, yes. (laughs) So who is listening to that? 
connect with us if you want to tell your story. And if yes. it is, if you don't want to have it public, it, it's fine. You know, just tell us your story, and we are listening together, Bonnie and me. Okay. <laughs> So, Bonnie, we are at the end of the hour. I, I thank you very, very much. It was interesting, you know, because I have no idea about America, as I thought, as I said, and also thought. And uh, I learned a little bit more, and I got many insights and many connections by what you were ta talking about. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And people, come and see more of the Conscious Aging series. We have already done six. No, five uh, blogs, and that will be here, the sixth one. Um, come and listen. There are many, 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 many topics about aging, healthy aging, conscious aging, and so on. Thank you very much to you and to the people who are listening. 